We are coming near the end of our sermon series on the War Room, based on the War Room movie and based on Scripture. We still have another week of War Room small groups, but today is the last day of our sermon series on War Room. We've talked about where to pray, when to pray, to whom we pray, and today we're going to talk about how to pray how to pray. From Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 7 and 8, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So we want to look at several aspects of what Jesus teaches us in these verses and some that follow on how to pray. The first thing that we want to notice is focus on the one to whom you pray, not on the words you say. Sometimes we we get so concerned about what words we're going to say that we forget who it is that we are praying to. Prayer is more about him than it is about us or the needs that we're presenting. Somehow we have kind of reduced prayer to nothing more than just giving God a list of things that we want or things that we need or that maybe somebody else wants or need. But prayer is so much more than that. And, and prayer has to begin with God and our relationship with God. And really that's what prayer is all about, is, is bringing us in closer relationship with God the Father. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, the next two verses, Jesus begins to give us the Lord's Prayer. He says, "Then this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It begins with God. And we, we need to remember that God is our good, good Father in heaven. We, we need to respect him. We need to have a sense of awe for him. But he is not our enemy. He's not looking for ways to, to uh, discipline us or to push us away from himself. He is a good father who wants us to draw close to him. And God's name is holy. Angels proclaim that he is holy, holy, holy in his presence in heaven. And... Uh, I've shared this many times with the congregation, but, you know, when the Bible was being written, the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek, uh, they, they couldn't just do some of the things that we do uh, with a computer. You know, you don't just hit a button and make it bold to make it stand out or underline it or make it italics or something like that. Uh, but the way that they emphasized something was to repeat it. And uh, the scripture in Isaiah chapter 6 tells us that that the angels in heaven are proclaiming holy, holy, holy. It's taking the word holy and making it bold and making it italics and underlining it and putting exclamation points behind it and everything else that we can do to emphasize it. God is holy and his name is holy. And God is the king of his kingdom. Jesus said, pray your kingdom come your will be done. And uh, while we live in this world and we have earthly governments and we uh, uh, try to abide by the laws of, of mankind as believers in Jesus Christ, we are actually part of another kingdom, the kingdom of God. God is greater than, than we are, and he is the king of his kingdom. And our prayers center on his kingdom coming on earth and his will being done. He is the center of our prayers. I heard not long ago of a person who went to a church, and it was a contemporary style worship, and there was a worship band on the platform, and it was cranked up loud, and lights were flashing, and they had smoke fog machines, smoke machines going, and uh, people were out uh, raising their hands, and they were dancing, and this person who wasn't used to going to church said, oh, that really looks bad for God, that he has to be treated like a rock star. Well, you know what? The opposite is true. We shouldn't be treating human performers like God. 
God deserves our praise. God deserves us to raise our hands. God deserves us to dance in his presence. God deserves all of our praise. What we, take, what we give to man, they don't deserve. We're not treating God like a rock star. Unfortunately, too many times we treat rock stars like God. And so we are to lift him up. And so when we go to pray, Jesus said the first thing that you need to remember is who you're praying to. While we are praising him, we're joining the angels in heaven as they're singing his praises, as they're singing holy, holy, holy. We're joining their chorus. We lift him up in praise. The multitudes of heaven, the book of Revelation tells us, Shout as the sound of many waters. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls or even a smaller falls, or if you've been to the shore and you hear the breaking of the waves against the shore, the sounds of, of heaven are, are like that, that they're, they're so loud you kind of have to yell over them, or you may not even be able to be heard over them. Depending how close you get to the falls, you, you can't even hear someone speaking. This is the, the praise that to, is to give, you're to give to God and that we're to give to God. And that's how we begin our prayer. Uh, our Father, which art in heaven, how be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's not about, well, I need this, and I want that, and my friends should have this, and I'm praying for them. God wants us to do that, but that's not where we start. We begin with him and our relationship with him and lifting him up and giving praise and glory to him. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How can God's will take place on earth. We're praying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does that happen? When the children of God go to God and humble themselves and submit themselves to God and live for him according to his will and and his word, then his will will be accomplished. The second thing that we want to notice is that we are to focus on the needs with simplicity and and humility. We, we don't go to God like, okay, you owe us this. You know, I've, I've served you for a certain number of years, or I've sacrificed this in my life, and I gave up that for you, and that somehow because of, of us following him and serving him that God owes us something. God doesn't owe us anything. When, when we come to him with our needs, we come with a humble spirit. We come with a submissive spirit, and, and we say, God, you know, from our perspective, this seems like it would be a good thing to have, but you know what's best. And, and we come asking that your will be done. Surrendering to God all that we are and have is a beautiful and necessary act of worship. You, you say, oh, I can't worship, I can't carry a tune. I can't worship, I can't play an instrument. No, that isn't what worship is all about. Those are human expressions of worship, but worship is about submitting your heart to God, submitting yourself to his will, living out your life. What we do here for a, on, a Saturday, or excuse me, on a Sunday morning, couldn't even remember what day of the week it is, um, uh, what we do here on a Sunday morning for an hour is but a small portion of our act of worship. Our act of worship is living out our lives for him on a daily basis. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, Jesus gives us the rest of this prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It it is humble dependence upon God that we come before him. We we ask him for things because we know that he has power, because he has all resources. He's not limited in what he can do. And when we express value and worth to God and thank him for his overwhelming faithfulness in the past, he 
he becomes in our hearts so much bigger than our present worries and eclipses any future anxieties that we have. You know, you can take a small coin and you can hold it up and a mountain range off in the distance and you can block an entire mountain with a quarter because of perspective. That quarter is much smaller than the mountain, but because you're focusing on the quarter, you can't see the mountain. But when we come to God in prayer, we begin by focusing on God and who He is. And we begin to recognize how big He is and how great He is and how powerful He is and how holy He is and that He has all resources in His hands and that He can take care of everything. And suddenly, as we see God getting bigger in our perspective, our problems become smaller. And we realize that our problems are no match for our God. And, and so we, we lift him up and we praise him. In James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, it says, But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. We come before God in a humble spirit. We come before him recognizing our own sinfulness. We come recognizing his greatness and his holiness and we bow before him, and we bring our request to him in humility. He owes us absolutely nothing. We owe him everything. But we also know that he loves and cares for us, and since we live in this broken world, there are things that are in our lives that we need, and we bring them to him, but we must bring them in a spirit of humility. Jesus responds with grace in our knee, to our needs. Isn't it wonderful? We saw the scene of the husband humbling himself because he had broken their marriage covenant. He had lost his job because of uh, some of the sinful things he had done. And he humbled himself, and she offered grace. How much more will God, our Father, offer grace to us? He's already sent Jesus into the world to, to die on the cross for our sins, if we will just come to him in a humble spirit and come before him and and seek his forgiveness, uh, he will forgive our sins. The, The more that we hurt, the more grace that he gives. The more we struggle with temptation, the more grace he gives. Don't, don't try to overcome temptation on your own. If you have something that's been dominating your life and dominating your mind and you say, well, I'm just going to give that up. I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to make it different. Uh, You'll find that before long, temptation overtakes you and you're going back and doing it again. But if you come before God and say, this problem is bigger than me. I can't handle it. But God, you can. And you come to him and and, uh, uh, ask him for help. The more the temptation comes, the more grace that he gives. Take your hurts and your struggles to Jesus, and he will give you grace. Sometimes he will give you healing. Sometimes he will give you deliverance. And sometimes he will just give you grace and strength to live through it. He didn't promise that this world would be perfect. This is a broken world. And so sometimes there are things that we lack. Sometimes there are illnesses. Sometimes there's pain. Sometimes our hearts are broken. He didn't say that he's going to make everything all right. That's what heaven's for. This is earth. Someday everything will be made right. But in this world, sometimes there's brokenness. But if you take your brokenness to Jesus, he will give you his grace and the grace that you need to face the trials of your life. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 36, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Part of our prayer is that we should be looking on the needs of others. And we need to ask God to give us eyes to see the needs around us. It's very easy for us to see what our needs are. We feel our pains. We experience our brokenness. But we need eyes from God to be able to see the needs of others and to have compassion upon them. Ask God to give us compassion to meet the needs of others that we see around us. And then the third thing that we want to notice is to focus on the harvest, not your pleasure and comfort. You see, when we come to prayer, again, we, we come many times with this list of what we want, what we need, what we would like, and say, God, give this to us. But we need to come and say, there's a great harvest. How can we be involved in the harvest? How can we reach people for Jesus Christ? Jesus told his disciples to focus their prayers on workers for the harvest. In Matthew 9, 37 and 38, it says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the only place in Scripture that it's recorded that Jesus asks someone else to pray for a need that he has. He was always responding to other people's needs. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father himself for needs. But he never gave a specific prayer request to others except right here. And that request was that they would ask the Lord of Harvest to send out workers into his field. Jesus pointed out the vastness of the harvest. We're living in a world with about 7 billion people in it. There are many hurts. There are many people who are far from God. There are many people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus asked the disciples to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out workers into his harvest field. And you know what? Sometimes we talk about waiting for a call. Every believer has a call. Every believer has been given the great commission to go into the world and make disciples. Every one of us. And so God has called us, and every believer has a call to go and to serve. We are to be servants of God in this world. That's why he left us here in this world, to be his servants. Several times this morning I talked about having a relationship with Jesus Christ and being a follower of Jesus Christ, and perhaps you've already done that before today or perhaps even at communion time, but I just want to pray a prayer with you. That is a prayer of repentance and asking Jesus to be your Savior. And if you have not received Jesus as your Savior, I would like for you right now this morning, you don't have to get up, you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to say a word out loud. But as I pray this prayer, if you mean it in your heart, yes, Lord, this is me, this is what I need, this is what I want. I want to follow you. If you mean it in your heart, you can know Jesus as your Savior before you leave here today. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, We come before you today, and Lord, there may be those in this room who have never come to know you, never made a decision to follow you, and Lord, I pray that you would help them to pray this from their heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin like all other human beings. I've committed acts of sin, but today I repent. I turn from my sin, and I turn to you. I ask you to forgive my sin and to be my Savior, and I choose today to follow you all the rest of my life that I might be able to be with you throughout eternity. Lord, help me to be part of this great family of God that you use to bring your will on earth, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've prayed that prayer with me in your heart, after the service, uh, bring your connection card right here to the door. I'll be standing there to greet you, and you give me that card. I have a Bible I want to give to you, and then it, later in the week, we'll send you helps uh, to help you get started. We also have classes to help you uh, to learn about the essentials of Christianity and help you on your start to serving the Lord. I, I, one last thing before we, I conclude this message, as we're concluding this series on the war room, I want to put forth a challenge to us to be a more praying people 
and to be a more praying church. I know that there are many of you who pray every day. You pray every day for me. You pray every day for this church. You're praying and carrying a burden for your family. I, I know that, but I'd like for us to, as a whole church family, to, I want to challenge us to pray. Uh, this Thursday, May the 5th, is a very special day. Uh, first of all, uh, in America, it's the National Day of Prayer. It's the first Thursday in the month of May. And uh, a number of years ago, that first Thursday in the month of May uh, was designated as the National Day of Prayer. But also in, in the Christian world, this Thursday is the Day of Ascension. Now, the Day of Ascension and the National Day of Prayer don't always fall on the same day, but they do this year. Uh, that, the, the Day of Ascension is based on when Easter happens, which is based on when the Passover happens, and you'd have to go, I don't want to go into the whole thing uh, back into the Levitical uh, law about that, but uh, that moves. You know, sometimes Easter's early in March, sometimes it's later in April, so it doesn't always fall the same time. But Ascension Day is a very important day. It's the day that Jesus gave us, Acts 1.8. Matter of fact, in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will be, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And in verse 9, the, the very next thing in the narrative is that he ascends back to the Father and he is interceding for us. That's how tightly those two things go together. And so what I would like us to do is to join what the apostles did. On the day of ascension, when Jesus ascended back into heaven, they went to Jerusalem, and they went into an upper room, and for 10 days they prayed. There was about 120 people in that upper room. I don't know how they took care of sanitation. I don't know how they took care of getting meals. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us all those things, but I do know that they were in that upper room for 10 days from Ascension Day to Pentecost Day. And what I would like for us to do is to set aside 10 days of prayer. You have a sheet in your worship folder uh, with an outline for each day and a, a different topic of prayer. We're going to begin praying for our nation. It is the National Day of Prayer, and Paul told Timothy, first of all, to pray for those in leadership over us. And so we're going to begin with prayer for our nation, and then for our church, for our church leaders, for our worship, for our children's ministry, our student ministry, adult discipleship, outreach, our local schools, as well as closing out then on May the 14th with Revival and Spiritual Awakening, and then May the 15th is Pentecost Sunday when we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. And so what we would like for you to do is take that. There's a scripture with every section. There are some bullet points for you to pray. You can pray longer. You can pray short. If you just read this off the paper to God and say, God, this is what we're praying about today, I'd like for you to make a commitment to uh, pray with me and with your church through for that 10-day period. And God did an amazing thing. When the apostles and the 120 people assembled in the upper room and they gave themselves to 10 days of prayer, the Holy Spirit came and he did a mighty work and he drove them out into the streets and he drove them out of Jerusalem and around the world. And we have the gospel today because of what God did as a result of those 10 days of prayer. And I believe God wants to do great things at Calvary Wesleyan Church and we will only know them and what they are when we give ourselves to prayer. So what I would like for us to do in closing this morning, if you find that guide, if you're willing to join in this 10 days of prayer, I'd like for you to get up out of your seat and come down to the front. Often we get the the front filled and there's not enough room. You can go just back through the aisles. But I'd like you to make a move forward from where you are if you are willing to give yourself to the 10 days of prayer. We're going to do that right now. If you just get up, we don't, no music, no, uh, no long invitation, Uh, If you're willing to pray and to to pray together uh, for your church and for our nation, I'd like to have prayer with you together as we begin this 10 days of prayer, beginning this coming Thursday. Thank you for coming. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the power of prayer. We thank you for the privilege of being able to pray. 
We just watched a video clip from a movie, and it's, it's acting. And, but yet, what a powerful prayer. And Lord, in reality, in our nation, we need that kind of prayer. We need an army to be raised up, an army of people who know who they are in Jesus Christ and are not ashamed of Jesus. Lord, we need people who will let their voices be heard, who will be witnesses of Jesus Christ and what he has done. We thank you for the wonderful videos that we watched last night of people's lives who were transformed. Lord, we need many, many, many more than that. We thank you for the 48 candles that were lit for people who came to know Christ as Savior. But Lord, we need many, many, many more than that. And so, Lord, we thank you for this group of people here that are part of this church and who who are saying we will give ourselves to 10 days of prayer and we'll pray for these topics and we'll pray for these bullet points and many will pray far beyond this and give themselves to a half hour prayer or an hour of prayer and maybe even adding fasting to their prayer. But Lord, we thank you for these who, who are willing to give of themselves in prayer. And Lord, we pray that as a result of the the focus on prayer, that you will do great things at Calvary Wesleyan Church, that you'll do great things through Calvary Wesleyan Church. Lord, we love one another in the body of Christ, but we love our neighbors as well. We, we love our community. We, we love our schools. We love the people that live around us. And Lord, we pray that somehow you'll, you'll fill us with your spirit, that we'll go out into this community around us. And, and wherever we live, not everyone lives right here in this community, but that we would go out and that we would be your witnesses in the world. And Lord, it's so easy for us to complain about what goes on in our nation and what goes on in government. But Lord, the greatest power to to bring transformation in our nation is the power of prayer. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to pray for our nation, to pray for those who govern us, to to pray for our unsaved neighbors, to pray for our, our children who are lost, to pray for our parents who have never come to know Jesus as their Savior, to pray, dear Lord, that your kingdom come, that your will be done. You, dear Lord, alone are worthy. And so, Lord, we come to you in many situations in our lives, whether it deals with health, whether it it deals with bad choices of people around us, whether it deals with our government and and, and our nation. There are many things, Lord, that we feel like our hands are tied and we cannot make a difference. But, Lord, we can make a difference when we take them to you. And so, dear Lord, we pray from, for, from this church here on this corner of Pennsylvania Avenue and Ridgelawn that you will send a mighty revival of your spirit that you will send us out to be your witnesses and that there will be transformation in our homes, that there will be transformation in our communities, that there will be transformation in our schools, that there will be transformation in our government because God's people pray. Lord, we are not limited because you are not limited. You can do all things. And so we place ourselves in your hands and together we unite in these 10 days of prayer, expecting that you will do great things beyond anything that we could hope or imagine. And Lord, we give you glory in advance. We know that you're going to do great things. Anything that's ever happened in our lives, anything that's ever happened in this church will pale into comparison to what you can do when your people pray. And so we give ourselves to prayer and we look with anticipation to what you're going to do. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Now send us forth into this world to be your children, to be your light, and to make a difference through the power of your spirit and the power of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.